have uh, Acts chapter 21 uh, open in front of you, that would be helpful um, because we are going to read uh, a little bit more. And what I plan to do this morning is to read um, bits of the story as we go along. So we're not going to read the whole of it and give the, the game away, but uh, we're going to read it uh, in bits and pieces as we, as we go through. But if you have it open, that would be great. Page 1170, Acts 21. Uh, now, um, I know this, this sounds like I'm getting old, but when, when I was a, a child, TV was very different from what it is today. Um, and uh, perhaps you can remember, and this will age you, um, you can remember when there were less channels. So if you can remember when there were two, that puts you at a certain age, uh, or three or four or five, uh, maybe you can remember those days. But in the days before internet viewing, when uh, things were serialized, they were put, you know, one a week, and you couldn't watch ahead, you couldn't binge watch the whole thing, you had to wait. And so to keep you coming back for more, because you might get bored after a week, um, they would end the episodes of most things with some kind of cliffhanger. And some situations, it was where you felt as if the hero had lost everything, you know, the car was going over the cliff or something. And you, you had to come back next week to find out, only to find, of course, that they had escaped and they lived to fight another day. Or maybe sometimes they would switch it and put it the other way around. So maybe you get to the end of an episode and everything looked fine and everything was good. And you thought, ah, oh, that's, that's settled and it's okay. And then the next week, the tables would suddenly turn. You realize that they were, they were back in danger again and a whole new drama would arrive. It's a kind of plot device, I think, um, that the soaps love well. I've not watched many soaps, but the ones I have, it's usually when the character says something like, this is the happiest day of my life. And you say, oh, no, something <laughs> terrible and catastrophic is going to happen. It's usually at Christmas as well that it happens. And the whole thing comes crashing down. Well, it's sort of a bit like that with what we're reading at the minute in the book of Acts. We're working our way through this kind of, in, in a kind of serialized way, really, because we're looking at a bit each week, through the story of the days of, of the early church as told to us by Luke. And now in the last part of Luke's second book, centered on one of Christ's apostles, uh, the apostle Paul. And we followed Paul around his uh, missionary journeys. And at certain points, Luke kind of takes a breath and gives us a little summary of how things are going. And then there's this kind of pause and we've, we've paused at those points. But we're in this last section now. And um, they're really just one long story, the, the ongoing story of, of what's happening to Paul. And so over the last couple of weeks, we saw Paul uh, finish off his, his third and last journey, say goodbye to the church leaders at Ephesus and head towards Jerusalem. And he's being compelled to go there, he says, by the Holy Spirit. And he's also being told when he gets there, he's going to face prison and hardship. And lots of his friends along the way tell him the same thing and draw the conclusion that therefore he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. But he is being compelled by the Spirit to go there. He's, he knows this is where he has to go. And, uh, and so he, he follows God's leading and he, and he goes there. And uh, last time we, we saw Paul arrive in Jerusalem, as we just read, uh, his brothers in Christ there are expecting trouble already. And so they've heard these rumors about uh, Paul's supposed anti-Jewish stance, which wasn't true, of course. And in an attempt to head off the trouble, they suggest to Paul that he takes part in this uh, and, and pays for the purification rites of these four guys. Um, and uh, the leaders feel this will kind of just calm things down, quell the rumors <coughs> and maybe uh, diffuse a, a problem for him. And so Paul agrees to this for the sake of the unity the peace of the church and uh, if we hadn't read on we might think all would be well for for paul but uh, but after looking like paul's actions will have nipped this trouble in the bud we know things are about to take a turn for the worse so we're going to read the story as i say as we go along each bit the first point is a bit longer but the reading is a little bit shorter so don't gauge how long the sermon is going to be based on that um it's actually 10 to 12 so we're, we're late but no it's not really <laughs> Good. Let me, let's read then. We'll read from Acts 21, verse 27, just down to verse 36. So this is uh, the next part of the story. When the seven days were nearly over, the, the purification days, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had pre previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, 
News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he'd done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed him kept shouting away with him. Just pause there for a minute. I've got three points this morning. My first one is this. Living for Christ and following him means following him in suffering. Now, if uh, that's ringing a bell from last week, it's because it's basically the same point as one of the points from last week. Uh, last week our points were all about following Jesus and what that means and this is one of the things it means and it still means this and we still see it in Paul's life here because it's still happening following Jesus living for him means following him in suffering for the gospel and for his sake in some way or other if you remember Paul said that even though he knew what was ahead his life was worth nothing to him if he might just finish the task that God had given him he said he was ready to be bound and even killed for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, as Christians, we may not we may not be all called to that, to that extreme, but it is the reality of following Jesus in a world that is in rebellion against him. And at some point, in somewhere or other, whether mild or severe, we will, we will suffer for him. Uh, this is why the Apostle Paul can say to his friend Timothy a little bit later on, oops, sorry, <coughs> these words. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He doesn't put any caveats on that at all, does he, Paul? He doesn't say, well, if this happens or that happens. He says, if you want to live a godly life in Christ, you will be persecuted. It will happen. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse. So there, there is a reality of our Christian lives because of the way that the world is, because of sin, because of, of the devil, because of, our, of the hearts of those who are opposed to God. Well, back to our story then. We'll see this working out. Paul's a, attempt to put down the rumours um, about him being against the Jews and against the Jewish law and against Jerusalem, against the temple. That was the accusation against him. What he did in taking part in this purification rite with these men failed uh, to uh, to stop those who wanted him dead, basically. And uh, as we read at the beginning there, verse 27, the rites were nearly complete. It was nearly finished. Um, he was in the temple. And uh, some of the Jews that had opposed Paul elsewhere in Asia were in Jerusalem for, presumably, for the Feast of Pentecost, which is why Paul wanted to get there. And so Paul had avoided kind of traveling back through Asia to, to maybe to avoid trouble. And they'd, they'd come. They'd come to Jerusalem. And here they are now, aware of his presence, determined to, to stop him. And so they stir up the whole crowd in the temple and um, they tell lies about him. They accuse him of teaching all men everywhere, which is a pretty grand claim for, for anybody, even Paul. All men everywhere against our people, our law, our place, this place. And it's deeply ironic, isn't it, that, that they were his people, weren't they? They were Paul's people. And it was God's law that Paul observed. And it was his place because he had been brought up in Jerusalem. And then there was this one final accusation that seemed to be worse than all the rest. They accuse him wrongly of bringing a Gentile into the courts of the temple. Uh, now, I don't know if you, if you know anything about the temple, the, 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 the temple courts were like sort of concentric, uh, it's not uh, rectangles really, like a, a concentric thing. And there were different parts that different people could go into. So um, here's, here's a very poor map of the temple, that <laughs> sort of. So you can see uh, Holy of Holies and the sort of central part of the temple here. This was very grand entrance front here. And then there is this place where offerings were made, the altar and so on. And then there's this court, the court of women, the outer court, and there's various chambers here. And then there's gates, and right at the very outside here, just on, on the very edge of things, is the court of the Gentiles. And this is the only place that a non-Jew could come. So this guy, uh, Trophimus, that they, they think Paul has brought in, they're accusing him of bringing him in here where he's not allowed. Now you might say, well, big deal, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the problem? Well, they found, archaeologists have found... Uh, some inscription stones that used to be at that entrance. Um, they, f they found them in, in two different times. And uh, here's, here's a recreation of it. And of course, your Greek will allow you to, to read. No, it won't, will it? Uh, here's what it says. Here's, here's with the translation. This is what it said at the entrance uh, 
to the rest of the temple from the court of the Gentiles. No stranger is to enter within the balustrade, the area around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. Right, so you come past this as a Gentile and your, your, your blood is on your own head. The Romans had given the Jews authority to sentence people to death if they went in where they weren't supposed to. They would have been defiling the temple. So if Paul had brought this guy in, this guy would be, this guy Trophimus would be legitimately uh, able to be executed. Um, so it's a serious accusation that they're accusing Paul of and I think, I think maybe some nationalism and some religious zeal and probably a bit of mob dam- dynamics meant that it wasn't difficult to get everybody stirred up especially in the temple area and perhaps others that were around and the Jews soon raised this angry crowd, this mob and they grab Paul and they drag him out of the temple they shut the doors of the temple so Nothing else can defile it, presumably, and they proceed to beat him to death. Now, if the Roman commander hadn't intervened at that point, Paul's story probably would have ended there, wouldn't it? Just as the Jews had made assumptions about Paul, so the commander of the army does the same kind of thing. Uh, he, he sort of assumes that Paul must be, <coughs> must be somebody that is causing trouble and he must be the source of the trouble, so he arrests him, puts him in chains without asking anything about him. The situation here for Paul was uh, serious. But living for Christ means following him in suffering, even if it means this kind of suffering. Um, there's a, there's a very uh, a poignant sense here of Paul following Jesus because he's in the same place where Jesus came and was rejected and was taken and was killed. And I think I, I read in one of the countries it was probably about 30 years, about 27 years earlier that Jesus' his death took place. <coughs> So likely many of the same people are still there and it would be fresh in their memories. And then their words as they, as they send Paul away, as they cry for him to be taken away, are the same words that they had used of, of the Lord Jesus, away with him. Here's Luke's account of Jesus' uh, arrest. Uh, with one voice they cried out, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. They wanted a murderer rather than the Lord Jesus himself. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him, away with him, get rid of him. The situation here for Paul was very specific, and it, and it won't be the same for us, will it? It won't be our situation. This will not be the flashpoint for us, will it? Whether, uh, whether a Gentile has gone into the temple or whether we're speaking against, against um, supposedly against the law. Um, but following Christ will put us at odds, won't it, with an ungodly world? What Paul said to Timothy, if you want to live a godly life in Christ, you will be persecuted. It will put you at odds with the world. Why is that? Well, because I think sin is rebellion. And our hearts without Christ are drawn towards sin and away from him, away from God. And so as with our first, that first sin in the garden, without Christ, we suspect God. It's Adam and Eve's sin, wasn't it? To to mistrust God, to think that we know better. And our eyes, as the Bible says, are really are blinded to the truth. And so the lives of Christians living faithfully will be a challenge and it will be a, a kind of implied judgment on the rest of the world. Well, it ought to be anyway. If everyone around you is uh, is casual with the truth, you know, and uh, take some license with it, and you insist on being honest and truthful, that will be a challenge, won't it? And it will make you unpopular, I'm quite sure. If you refuse to pass on gossip, as you as you should as a Christian, and everyone else kind of relishes in it, you will not be the favourite. You'll not be the one people want to talk to. If you uh, show in your life that it's possible to live selflessly and sacrificially, with a kind of costly love generously and meekly and humbly and uprightly your life will be uncomfortable for those who want to justify the way they live you know for all sorts of other reasons and so when you share the truth about uh, of god's word about all kinds of things it will it will not make you popular if you talk about the christian views of where this world comes from where we come from and about sin and about judgment and about God and our relationship to him and about Jesus and about salvation and about heaven and hell and a host of other uh, teachings that the Bible is clear on. These things, they might not just be dismissed by others or mocked, but actually might cause a kind of violent reaction against them and against us. So we might be misunderstood, as Paul was here. We might be misrepresented and there might be lies told and we might be hated and sidelined. And people might even wish us dead for what we believe. It's happening, isn't it, to our brothers and sisters across the world. 
Now that all sounds a bit bleak, doesn't it? A bit negative. But when you read Paul's letters later on in the New Testament, you often see suffering linked with, not only with comfort, with the comfort that God gives, but also with glory. Here's, here's a couple of verses from, uh, from Romans and then some words to Timothy. So Romans 5. And we rejoice, says Paul, in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we rejoice in our sufferings. He's not, a kind of, he's not a kind of someone who just takes pleasure weirdly in sufferings. We rejoice in them, he says, because they are serving a purpose in God's providence. We know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character and character, hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. There is a purpose in it, a good purpose in God's purposes, even in our sufferings. Um, What about these verses from Romans 8? If we are children... Then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, which is quite a statement, isn't it? Heirs of God, inheritors of what he's promised, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So there's not an equality, there's a disparity. The glory will be much greater and we suffer these things because we suffer with Christ that we might share in his glory. And then Paul says to uh, to Timothy, um, of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I've believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. That day, the, the, the day of the Lord, the day when there will be a reckoning and there will be a judgment. So Paul was a man under authority um, so that the suffering of hostile crowds didn't really faze him at this point. As long as he was faithful to Christ, that was the main thing. And then even in the most severe sufferings that he knew far more than we do, he knew the comfort of God's presence. He knew the value of suffering for him in strengthening hope. And he held in his sight the, the glory and the privilege of the gospel so that he was not ashamed to, uh, to count Jesus as his saviour. So even if you do suffer for the gospel, even if there are disadvantages and misrepresentations, even if uh, you experience that, keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Don't be ashamed, but be bold. Comfort and hope and glory uh, come with suffering. Okay, secondly, let's read a little bit more of the story. This is a little bit of a longer section. So uh, look with me at uh, Acts 21 verse 37. (coughs) Verse 37. As I say, this is a bit of a longer read, but the, the point is a bit shorter. So verse 37, as the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen to my, now to my defence. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers, and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you'll be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptised and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, 
I fell into a trance and I saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Just pause there. Living for Christ means suffering for his name. But secondly, it means telling the story of his grace to us. Telling the story of his grace to us. <clears throat> Paul asked to speak to the crowd. And uh, he's obviously speaking to the soldiers as well that are, are trying to carry him to safety. And the words of the commander here showed just how, how misunderstood Paul was by the authorities. There was this Egyptian guy apparently... And he led a failed rebellion. They'd gone outside Jerusalem and waited for it to fall. And, and then they'd sort of departed. And, and so the commander assumes Paul is this guy that's come back. And that's why everybody's in uproar. Uh, Paul puts him right and uh, ask, asks to speak to the crowd. And uh, in a similar way to Stephen's speech that he references earlier, he speaks to brothers and fathers. He speaks to his own people in their own language, Aramaic. And uh, they listen for a time. So that's my point. Living for Christ means telling the story of his grace, telling your story, giving a word of personal testimony. It probably shouldn't be the first thing that you sort of blurt out when you meet people, your whole life story, your whole testimony. But somewhere on the line, in some way, your story should be told. And it ought to be the story, not of, you know, of, of how great you are, but of God's grace to you, of what God's done with you. This is the second time in Acts we hear Paul's testimony, and it won't be the last one. There's another occasion as well. And so it's not a carbon copy. He doesn't just sort of recite his testimony as if he'd got it written down. But he emphasizes points here to, to allay the fears of those who think he is against the Jews. And uh, so he mentions his uh, training under this esteemed uh, Jewish teacher, Gamaliel. He mentions his own persecution of Christians at one point at the request of the council who, are, who, who he's going to meet in a few moments. And he also mentions God's grace in turning his life around. He mentions... This uh, respected Jew who uh, came to open his eyes, Ananias, and uh, how, how good a standing this man had, and uh, who helped him to, to see again. And, he's, and Paul is also clear about God's call on his life, his commission to be a witness and a preacher. And he gives true testimony about God's warning him of the hostility that he's going to face in Jerus Jerusalem, even in those early days. And he doesn't hide his former way of life persecuting Christians. And he's clear on the commission God has now given him to take the good news to the Gentiles. Now, hold the tension at that thought because there is a tension there. When he says Gentiles, it all, it all uh, gets a little bit more angry. But living for Christ means telling the story of his grace. That's what Paul does. It's his story. It's what happened to him. It's of God's grace to him. And it's of the way that God met him and, and transformed his life. If you're following Christ and living for him, you have a story, and it's a glorious story of God's grace. Uh, it might not be as dramatic as the Apostle Paul's and as dramatic as some others that you've heard, but it is your story, and it is also always a story of a life lived against God at one point, but then knowing his kindness and grace and mercy to turn you around. It's an eternal story because it doesn't end even at the end of this life. And it's a story that God may well use to bring other people to find life in Jesus themselves. You know, the power of personal stories is, is strong. We've, we've, we've done it ourselves. We've done missions where we've heard the stories of other people's real lives and how God met them. And there is something about that that is powerful. As we'll see, it may also, <laughs> in some circumstances, cause people to want to beat you to death as it did for Paul here. But that's, that's part of it, isn't it? It's still a story that you're able to tell as the opportunity arises. And here's, um, here's Paul again at the start of, of, of the book of Romans. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So he's not ashamed of telling people his story and telling people about Jesus because uh, the truth of the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it, is, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So we have a story to tell. You have a story to tell if you're a Christian. God met you at some point, whether it was dramatic or not, it doesn't really matter. And God 
has a, a part in your life and you have a story to tell. So pray this week for boldness and for opportunity in some way to tell something of the story of God's grace to you so that others might hear and they might know and they also might find uh, righteousness in Christ. I told you that was a slightly briefer point. Right, let's read the last part of the story. And again, this is a little bit longer, but the point won't be as long. Uh, let's read from verse 21 that we've just read. The Lord said to me, says Paul, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22 of, of Acts 22. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. And they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realised that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realise that he was a high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. <coughs> the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Amen. As I said, telling your story may not make you universally liked. It's quite a reaction, isn't it, in verse 22? It's quite a strong reaction. Um, just the mention of the Gentiles is enough to want them to just put, tear into pieces, really. Um, the commander wants to get to the bottom of the issue, so he decides to question Paul into torture. Um, Roman flogging was a vicious tool, and if it didn't leave you permanently damaged, it, it might be fatal, it often was. So um, Paul is not opposed at this point he doesn't do it always like this, but not opposed at this point to using the legal system to, to enforce his rights as a Roman citizen, which is what he does. And that's a helpful example for us just as a side point, isn't it? Might not always be the best course of action for us. And there may be times for us to rather be wronged and suffer loss. But at other times, it might be right to use the law to help us. And it, it wasn't legal to flog a Roman citizen before trial. So Paul, Paul is spared this torture at this point. And the commander is surprised that Paul, he implies that he'd sort of bought this privilege, he had at least, well, Paul hadn't, Paul had been born into it. But at this turn of events, it gives Paul another opportunity, by God's grace, not only to speak to the crowd or to the soldiers, but also to the Jewish ruling council, who many of them would have known him. Many of them commissioned him to do his work before he became a Christian. And so the last point I want to make is this, that living for Christ means being faithful to Jesus no matter what. There is, a, there is a boldness and a strength about Paul in this hostile situation. He knows this is the group that condemned Jesus to the cross. 
But rather than kind of try and wriggle out of it, maybe compromising himself in some way, he is crystal clear on his mission. Uh, 23 verse 1, he says, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. He can say in all honesty, no matter what anyone else says, he can say, I've fulfilled what God has called me to do. That's the most important thing. I can stand before God and say, I, I, I've been obedient. And that to Paul is, is worth more even than his life. He said he's fulfilled his duty to God in all good conscience. That may be why the high priest there is so hostile to Paul and orders that he be struck. Because here is this man claiming to be a good and faithful Jew, but claiming also to be following God in ministering to the Gentiles and telling them about Jesus and not forcing them to become Jews. And so he orders that Paul be struck. It follows a, a kind of surprising outburst from Paul. It's a little bit different to Jesus' response when he is in a similar position. And maybe that's why Paul apologizes. Um, no one is quite clear why Paul didn't recognize the high priest, because he probably wouldn't have said what he said if he had. Maybe it was, as some commentators think, his eyesight was so bad he didn't realize who, who it was. He couldn't see. It may have been something else. We don't know. But Paul then raises the matter of the resurrection. I, I don't know whether this was a deliberate thing to try and cause chaos. I'm not sure. But it does say, verse 6, Paul, knowing that some were Sadducees, some were Pharisees, he knew what he was doing. He knew that this would be a divisive issue. But I think more than just kind of stirring up a bit of trouble for the sake of it, I think this is a key issue, isn't it? We're going to read his letters later on, you'll see. <coughs> that, 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 that Jesus is the risen saviour is a key point, is a fundamental thing. And half of this Jewish council didn't believe it. And so it was something to stand on. And so he raises this issue, and of course the Pharisees all side with him then, and the Sadducees don't, and there's chaos again, and Paul has to be rescued. But it's particularly verse 11, the last verse, that I want you just to, to note as we finish. Just, just put yourself in Paul's shoes. What must have been going through his mind as he, uh, as he faced all these very stressful situations? You know, Would he make it out of Jerusalem alive? It didn't look like it, did it, at this point? If it hadn't been for the Roman soldiers, he probably wouldn't have been alive. Would he survive more than a few days? You'll see on the heading of your NIV Bible on after verse twenty, after verse eleven, is the plot to kill Paul. So you know that, that this is not going to be easy. And so that in into this situation, the Lord comes and stands near Paul to give him comfort and to give him courage. So there's the verse, verse eleven. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul. So it wasn't just a kind of word from a prophet. It wasn't just a kind of a vision he had. It, the Lord came and stood next to him and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Living for Christ means being faithful no matter what. Paul, Paul could say he had acted in all good conscience, even though it led him into the very jaws of death, so to speak. But saving himself, he could have gone the other way, would have meant betraying the, the commission that God had given him, disobeying him. And so, so he went, no matter what. He, he was faithful. And these words would be great encouragement, wouldn't they? Uh, John Stott, in his commentary on, on Acts, says, it would be hard to exaggerate the calm courage which this assurance must have brought to Paul during his three further trials, his two years' imprisonment, and his hazardous voyage to Rome. Well, there's a few spoilers there, because that's, that's what we're going to come to next, isn't it? That is what will carry Paul through all that's to come, all the things that are going to face him. He, he, knows, he knows from this word, and he trusts the Lord Jesus on this word, that he's gonna, he, he is going to face, uh, he is going to be able to testify in Rome. And so all the things that happen in the intervening times, all the hard things and the difficult things, he has this assurance that God has given him this, this road ahead. When we uh, follow the Lord Jesus, we know, don't we? We ought to know that there will be a cost. We are called to uh, take up a cross, aren't we? And to follow Jesus. A cross means death. We, we follow a risen saviour, one who is alive forevermore and one who can give comfort and courage for all the things that he takes us through. So don't compromise your faith for your own comfort, but follow Jesus faithfully and obediently it might be through very tough times it might be through uh, through dark times but he's able to give strength and courage and then finally to bring you home at the end of it so we have a great example in the apostle paul for what living for christ means following him it means following him in suffering seen that uh, twice we're going to see it again aren't we it means being bold to tell the story of his grace in our lives 
and it means being faithful to our Saviour no matter what comes, so that he in the end might have all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Let me just pray and then we'll sing together. Lord, we thank you that you're showing us through this story, Lord, uh, how, how it is that, Lord, following Christ might, might uh, mean many things in our lives. It might mean, Lord, that we too uh, suffer for the sake of Christ. And Lord, if that is the case, we, we don't relish that, but Lord, we, we, count, we count it a privilege that we might be uh, worthy of suffering for the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, many of our brothers and sisters in the church are facing such things even now, and Lord, and we, uh, we want to pray for them and ask that, Lord, you would give us uh, the same courage if uh, the time comes for us to uh, to stand for you, Lord, and in the face of those who want to, uh, Lord, to, to misrepresent us and lie about us and even to kill us. Lord, we pray uh, for that courage. And we pray that, Lord, you would help us, even as we do so, to be bold to tell the story of your grace in our lives, that, Lord, you have saved us from our sin and uh, you've given us new life and you've caused us, Lord, to be your witnesses. And so, Lord, help us to be bold uh, with that story. Help us, Lord, this week, we pray, that there might be some opportunity to tell someone about our faith and our trust in you and all that you've done for us. And uh, Lord, we, we pray uh, that, Lord, you would uh, help us to be faithful. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to follow you no matter what comes, Lord, whether it's good times or bad. We pray that we might be found as your faithful servants. And Lord, that you might give us courage and uh, draw near to us that we might know your help and blessing. So Lord, help us, we pray, uh, and help us to put these things into practice for your sake, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.